But now we are on to Michael and my uh, our favorite topic, which is charitable legacy planning. So um, get your brains kind of turned away from the Catholic bioethics to okay, how can I help my favorite charities out there? So Michael's going to kick us off. Yep, happy to do that. Thanks, Anna. I appreciate it. All right. So we've been dealing with some pretty heavy topics this morning, right? Uh, we've been dealing with funeral planning, pastoral care of the sick and dying, and uh, and Catholic bioethics. Pretty heavy in general. Important stuff to have, but, but pretty heavy. So I want you all just to kind of take a deep breath, if you would, and let it out. Because we're going to talk about stuff that's just a little bit more fun than, uh, than you know, some of the subjects we've been covering so far. Um, Anna and I are from the Catholic Foundation. How many people have heard of the Catholic Foundation? Oh, that's wonderful. Great. More than half the room. Well, the Catholic Foundation's been around for 70 years, and there are times when it feels like we're this really well-kept secret, you know, but we have been around for 70 years, and the vision or the mission of the Catholic Foundation is to promote compassionate charitable giving and stewardship that serves donors in the needs of our Catholic community. Well, that sounds great, but how do we do that? Well, there are a couple of things that the Catholic Foundation does that, uh, that you probably, one of which you're probably really aware of, one of which maybe not so much. So the thing that most folks are aware of are the grants that the Catholic Foundation makes back out into the Catholic community. Um, we just had a grant ceremony last week and uh, about $1.4 million was, was given out uh, at that time. We have two grant ceremonies a year, but it goes to support religious, educational, and charitable work uh, within the Diocese of Dallas for those unrestricted grants. So, and in the last 10 years alone, the Catholic Foundation has distributed more than $200 million, you know, out, and actually nationwide, and in some cases, we had a chapel that we were helping build over in, uh, over in Africa that a donor wanted to support. So, so we give grants, which is what a lot of people know. But what a lot of people don't know what we do and that's the part that Anna and I are very involved in. And that's helping individuals like you and me in terms of your own charitable giving. So in terms of we, what our mission is, is to hear what a donor wants to do and to suggest to them ideas in terms of how they can fulfill that. And hopefully in the process, we can make it easier, more tax wise, because there are tax implications in terms of charitable giving. Uh, and hopefully a little bit more fun because at its heart, charitable giving is a very pleasurable experience for people. I dare say that, and I'm going to speak for Anna just this one time, but, but I dare say that we've never had a situation where we were sitting down with an individual who was writing a check and they, were, they had a frown on their face when they were giving it to us and wanted to support you know, a cause that was important to them. So most of the time, it's just the opposite. They have a smile on their face, and not only that, but they're giving us a check for their donor advised fund, for example, that they use to support the charities that are important to them. And they say, I wish it could have been more. So just in general, people have a need to give back. They have a need to enter into relationship with each other. And that's part of what we do is we're not necessarily asking people to do more than they were doing before, but maybe we can help them do it better. So that's really part of the mission of what we do. So, you know, at, at, its, at its heart, what makes people focus on their charitable giving and their estate planning? Well, I can tell you what it's not. Nobody wakes up in the morning, absolutely nobody. They get out of bed and they stretch and say, this is a great day to do my will. <laughs> nobody does that, right? So, so what is it that makes people think of this? Well, it's life events that happen with people. It's, it's birth of your first grandchild. It's death of a parent, significant <coughs> illness of a spouse, graduation of a, the last child from college when you get that raise, right? So all those things start to make us think about our own mortality and, uh, and turn inward and in addition to our own mortality and, and trying to make sure you have your family taken care of, it's also a time of asking the question, how will I be remembered? So those are the kinds of triggers. Whether you have charitable intent or not, 
those are the things that typically make people think about estate planning and maybe going to our attorney and starting to reduce our wishes to paper. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and, and also, uh, you know, just in general, if you want to use a football metaphor, you know, halftime reflection. It's something where people take a step back because of those life events and they reflect on, on what their life has been so far and what they want it to be going forward. And then they usually come out of that and that's an impetus to start to make those types of plans. Um, a lot of folks have had a work career that was long and very, very positive, and they turned their attention, you know, they were very successful in their life. So now they turn their attention to impact. And how do I go from success to significance? Um, and that is something that is really a big driver for a lot of people, especially as I just turned 65 last year, um, as you get older is it really is something that comes to the forefront of a lot of people's minds. And, uh, you know, we've all heard the phrase, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. So, you know, there, there are really, really good ways to give back, and we're hopefully we're going to give you some ideas in terms of how that works with our time this, this afternoon. Okay, so we've been talking about planned giving, and you might be asking yourself, well, what are, what are they talking about? What is a planned gift? And so, you know, maybe you're like a lot of us who just, you know, when somebody, when an organization asks you for a donation, you're like, okay, I'll, I'll just write them a check, or I'll plug in my credit card online, which is great. Organizations love those types of gifts, but what we're talking about is a gift where you really have to stop and think, and how can I give the best gift the best gift for the organization and for yourself. And so that's just going to take a little bit more thought and a little bit more planning. So it's, it's also, you know, when we're talking about that checkbook philanthropy, we're not talking about, oh, how much is in my bank account? How much can I give this week or this month? But look more broadly and say, well, I've got assets. I was talking to one of the AV guys earlier, and he's like, oh, that's not for me. I don't have an asset. I said, well, do you have a house? Do you have a car? Do you have a bank account? Do you have a retirement account? Do you have a life insurance policies? I mean, these are all assets that are not liquid in a sense. You can't just you know, get those out of the bank really quickly. So that's why it takes some planning to decide, well, when do I want to access those assets? So it could be a, a gift that you make with those assets during your lifetime. Maybe you want to see that organization take advantage of your gift with, you know, helping with a scholarship or putting a new roof on the church or something like that. Or maybe you're like, well, I don't really want to have that asset out of my estate during my lifetime. Let's just postpone it. When I'm gone, they can do whatever they want with it. You know, so it's, it's one of those you can do it and or or during your lifetime, after your lifetime, or both. We like the both option. So um, sometimes that requires, you know, talking to your family, of course, talking to a financial planner, a CPA, attorney, whatever the case may be that you need help with. And it's usually much larger than you would have thought. You thought, oh, there's no way I could give, you know, $10,000, but maybe you have a $10,000 life insurance policy that's paid up that your kids don't need, and you're like, oh, well, I could just name the church as a beneficiary of that life insurance policy. So... Pretty, pretty fun. So why would you do this? I mean, you know, you think about it, you know, maybe you've been very generous to the church, you know, every week you've been given to them every week. And you're like, well, when you die, wouldn't you want to remember them with something? You know, either an outright gift of like, okay, I'll give them a, a ch I say a chunk, you know, maybe that's just like a one-time gift. Or maybe you want to give them a gift that's going to keep giving every week instead of just that one-time gift. So it's really for the organizations that you're passionate about, that, um, that you consider them part of your family because you've been remembering them every year for the last 20 years, maybe you've been donating to them. Um, yeah, and, and it's a way to stay connected to that organization. I mean, that you've been you know, supporting the SPCA for 20 years, you love puppies and kittens, and you know, maybe you wanna keep, keep giving to them in the future. And then there are certain certain assets that it's better to give it to those puppies and kittens than to your children, you know, just based on the tax aspect of it. So another thing is like, how do you want to be remembered? I mean, yes, you know, 
you want your kids to remember you, but you know, if you can name a charity and you know, maybe, maybe they put your name on the wall and, and that's going to be everybody that passes by that hall is going to say, who is that person? You know, um, that's one thing. Or you know, if you wanted to do a, a scholarship or some other type of fund that's going to be, be supporting somebody every year forever, they're going to say, oh, who was that person? And, and let me find out a little bit more about them. So it's just kind of thinking about beyond your children. I was reading an article the other day that says, you know, some families, they, they might not remember even who their great-grandparents' names were. You know, that's what, like four generations. So your gift could go, go beyond that four generations. And you're not going to live forever. And so, you know, we all get to decide what we do with our money if we can write it down and make it legal and all of that. But um, you want to be able to decide what you're going to do with your money and not have the government decide for you. So um, we talked about some different charities. It's, it's great to give directly to a charity if you choose. Um, you know, there's lots of charities out there. I'm going to put a plug in for St. Joseph's. Um, they, they would love to have your funds this year, next year, any year um, for, for, their, for their needs. Maybe you want to uh, organize a private foundation for you. Maybe you think, oh, it wouldn't it be great to have the Anna LeBlanc Family Foundation? It sounds good, but have you looked into it and know that it requires a lot of money and a lot of tax returns that you might want, not want to do with your free time? So um, just think about you know, what are those different options are, and hopefully you'll have a professional person to advise you on what would make sense for you. I think Michael has a comment. Yeah, this is just a quick comment. Okay, private foundation. There is quite literally nothing that is less private than a private foundation. <laughs> So their tax returns are out there. Everything that came into the, the foundation is public knowledge. All the grants that come out of it are public <coughs> knowledge. So private foundation just means it's you and your family. So, but all that information is very public. Uh, you know, and there are ways to keep that information a little bit more private or hold it a little bit closer. Okay, so the, the last point here is something that uh, Michael and I um, are fans of that we have, and I think even some people in this room have, which is they utilize a community foundation for their giving. And this is really just a way to organize your giving. Maybe, maybe you give to 10 different organizations in one year, and maybe you have to hunt down 10 different tax, return, tax receipts for those gifts every year. And so if you opened a donor-advised fund at a community foundation, like the Catholic Foundation or any other community foundation um, in Dallas. You know, there's the Dallas Foundation, Communities Foundation of Texas, the Jewish Foundation. There's a lot of different community foundations out there. So what I do is I put one, one bit of money into my fund, my little charitable checking account at the Catholic Foundation. The year I put that money in, I get one tax receipt. So that's all I have to keep track of for the whole year. And then I just go online to their donor portal and say, okay, give this much to my church, you know, a monthly gift for, the, for you know, 12, 12 months for that year, and this much to the Bishop's Annual Appeal, and this much to my university, and they send all those checks out. I don't get um, tax receipts from those organizations, just from the One Catholic Foundation. But it's a great way to organize, and you can go online anytime and say, well, how much did I give last year? to the Bishop's Annual Appeal, do I want to increase it, do I not want to? And then even putting money in, maybe you just want to do an automatic credit card back into your fund so that every year it kind of builds up. That's still me. Okay, good. So here are some of those other um, assets that we were talking about that are not necessarily you know, liquid in a sense right away, but when you give to an organization, whether that's to uh, maybe a smaller organization that maybe they can't handle certain types of gifts, whether it's, you know, maybe you wanted to give a house to a small nonprofit or you wanted to give stock to them, like, well, we're not set up to do that. You could utilize a community foundation, give that, give that um, asset to a community foundation, and they'll make sure that that smaller nonprofit can receive those funds. So that's another uh, way to utilize a community foundation. So... Um, a lot of organizations, when you think about a, a gift that's beyond your checkbook, as we talked about appreciated stock, maybe you, you bought stock when you were 18 and you were, wanted to get into the stock market and now you're 58 and you're like, oh, wow, that's really appreciated. 
you want to give the stock, not cash it out, and then give it. So we're trying to save you some taxes on those um, stock appreciation. And then say you're uh, 70 and a half and you, it's time to start taking that required minimum distribution and you can utilize your retirement account to make charitable gifts. And so that's another great asset to use when you're thinking about charity. Uh, if you're 70 and a half, you can give away, if you have at least you know, $105,000 per year to as many different charities as you want. And so that, so for husband and wife, that if they each have an IRA, they can each give out $105,000 from their IRA to support charity. So that's one where you would want the um, retirement account holder to send that check directly to charity. Don't take it for yourself because you're going to have to get um, claim that as income. Right. Something that we just want to dwell on this for just a moment in terms of IRAs and 401ks. Well, why? Well, the big reason is that, okay, when we were all growing up, okay, and our parents were working, chances are our mom and dad were working at a company for 40 years, okay, and they had these things, uh, oh, what do they call them? Oh, pensions. That's what they were called. They had pensions, and essentially what it was was people stayed at one place for their work career, and it was almost like a pact between the company and the employee where it's, you take care of the company during your work lifetime, and don't you worry. We will take care of you during your retirement. So that was the promise between the company and the worker, the employee. Okay, well, fast forward to today where people change jobs like they change their socks. And it's something where the, the shift of burden has gone from employer to us, and we're responsible for our own retirements. So as a result, okay, back again, 40 years ago when our parents were still working, what was the biggest asset you had, most likely? Your house, that's exactly right, because your retirement's taken care of. Well, fast forward to today, and we're seeing a global shift where in the future, the biggest asset that most people are likely to have is their retirement account. It's their IRA, their 401k. Not only that, but it is the key asset in your estate that when you pass it to your kids, your kids are going to pay tax on, okay? Which makes it a great vehicle if you're considering charitable giving. It really is important what you give to whom, okay? So we just wanted to talk about that for a moment. And just to highlight real quickly on that, uh, those other assets at the bottom, home, real estate, land, mineral interests, art and collections, what we're talking about is basically things that when you give it to the charity, they can sell it and turn it into cash so that they can pay the light bill, they can provide a scholarship, they can put a new roof on their building. I mean, some, anything that you have that would be considered an asset. So what would, what would that be? We kind of divided this out into current giving and the future giving. Current giving, of course, you know, cash and stock we talked about. We've talked about donor advised funds. And then um, the IRA charitable rollover, that's the, the one that you can give during your lifetime, 105000 What about later? You know, maybe you don't want to take money out of your assets, out of your pool right now. So just put that charity in your will. Don't even think about it. It's not going to cost anything today. And, you know, you could give them a, an organization a dollar amount or a percentage. Boom, you're done. And it'll happen later. You don't have to think about it. Maybe you want to establish an endowment. And when I say an endowment, that means a pool of money that is going to be there forever. They're, you know, the charity is not going to be able to dip into that so, so that that endowment is going to pay a percentage to whatever organization you choose so that they will have that income stream forever. So that endowment is permanent, can have your name on it, can have a family member's name on it. So that's another special thing. Uh, Michael's going to talk a little bit later about charitable gift annuities and ways that you can receive income during your life, and then at the remainder of your life, it can support charity. And then beneficiary designations are, are super easy. You can go online, any account that you have right now, whether it's a, a bank account, a life insurance policy, a retirement account. If there's a place that says, name your beneficiaries, uh, hopefully you've got somebody listed, right? Um, but you know maybe you've done everything for one person, maybe you've done it for a person and a couple of uh, children, 
but maybe you thought, well, instead of dividing it by three, maybe I could divide by four, maybe I could slip that, that charity in there as the fourth slot. So those are other ways that you can support charity after your lifetime. You don't have to worry about it during your lifetime. And then we talked about private foundations, private foundations. So, Right. And uh, Anna was talking about charitable remainder trust, charitable gift annuities. And we don't want to get into a lot of technical jargon, but just know that there are vehicles out there and they call them split interest gifts. And the reason why is because typically what happens is you put money into a charitable trust or a charitable gift annuity and you receive payments, quarterly payments for the rest of your life and, it's all, and you get a tax deduction you know, for the present value of what goes to charity after you're gone. And after you're gone, then charity receives a gift. So, um, you know, it's probably beyond the scope of what we want to talk about here in terms of, you know, those types of arrangements, but just know that they exist and they're, they're available for you. They can be very helpful in terms of a couple of different things. Uh, you know, for one, you know, we talked about being tax wise. There are times when you can reduce your tax burden by utilizing one of these types of instruments. So that's very, very important. Another is you can take an asset, for example, that's unproductive or underproductive and get more out of it. Let's say that you had a stock that you didn't want to get rid of, you know, because you'd have a lot of capital gains tax on it, but you're only getting like a 2% dividend a year, you know, that's coming out. Well, that is an asset that might be good to gift to one of these split interest arrangements, charitable trust or charitable gift annuity. So there are some numbers on the screen for you uh, in terms of charitable gift annuities are really interesting, you know, from a standpoint of um, it's the one thing in life where the older you get, the more they're going to pay you. Uh, you know, the, the rate is higher the, the older you get. As you can see from the example, you know, if you're 60 and it's one person, it's 5.2%. These rates, by the way, are set by the American Council on Gift Annuities. And the reason why most reputable charities utilize the rates that are set by them is because it presents a very balanced transaction, be balancing benefit for the donor and also benefit for the charitable interest that the donor wants to serve. So uh, pretty straightforward here, based on $10,000, if you're, if you're 80 years old, if we could back up for a moment, that'd be great. So if you're 80 years old, and here we go, and, and the rate is 8.1%, basically the annual payments are $810. Obviously, if it's $100,000 instead of $10,000, just add a zero. It's $8,100 a year. And the immediate tax deduction on that $10,000 is about 45% of that. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of the balance between the tax benefit and the income benefit. And the great thing about a charitable gift annuity is you can't outlive the income. You could live to be 130, and those quarterly payments would still be coming. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, if we have a donor and they tell us that they want to live forever or as close to it as possible, you know, we tell them, get a charitable gift annuity. You know, annuitants never die. So, <laughs> so it's something that, that is a very useful vehicle for the family, uh, you know, and, uh, and also it is a very, very nice gift for the causes that you want to support. Does anybody have any questions on that? Yes, sir. Are they, they are not. So uh, the question is, are they transferable? Uh, they're not. It's for one or two lives. And it's, it, it's not something that you could take and, and give to your kids, you know, for example, and have it for their lives as well. So it is tied to the two lives. Great question. Thank you. So any other questions on that? Okay, and there, is, there are split interest gifts. I mean, you know, we basically refer to them as now and later gifts. Um, you know, payments for life, charity gets, you know, life, or gets the gift afterwards. And those are the two main uh, vehicles that are used. However, we want to talk about one great now and later plan, okay, where you can, you can utilize it for your charitable giving now but you can also use it to benefit charities even after you're gone. And basically, Anna was talking about a donor advised fund, okay, and that's where you set it up, you put money in, and you recommend grants back out to the charitable causes that are important to you, right? Everybody understand that? Well, what happens and what a lot of 
folks do at the Catholic Foundation is when they die, they make plans for this donor advised fund to become a permanent endowment and continue to benefit the causes that are important to them. And again, you know, gifts from your estate, you know, you're not having to give them up while you're alive and while you need it. It's only after you're gone that these gifts come to, uh, you know, to this permanent endowment. So donor advised fund while you're alive, okay, second to die, usually you pass away. Gift comes from the survivor's estate to fund this endowment. And it's just a great way to remember the charities uh, that were important to you during your lifetime because um, let's just say for the sake of argument, let's say you were giving $5,000 to St. Joseph's uh, you know, every year and you've been doing it for a long time. Well, what happens to St. Joseph's when you go away? I mean, St. Joseph's was very important to you, but if, they, if you had not provided for them as part of your estate, well, then they have to go and find somebody else who's going to give them $5,000 you know, just to remain level. Does that make sense? So a lot of people think about it in that way in terms of continuing to support things that were very, very important to them through this permanent endowment and having that family connection, not just now, but for years after they're gone. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, okay. Michael, I'm gonna put a plug in here for the, the St. Joseph's Legacy Society. Um, they do have a pamphlet on the back, but if you wanted to do something special for an organization or for the church, let them know what you want to do. I mean, maybe you want to help with the piano or the music department or, you know, let the, let the organization know while you're, while you're living so that they can say, yeah, we can do that so that they can fulfill your wishes after your lifetime. Right, and, and it's something where you can do an endowment. You don't have to do an endowment. As a matter of fact, there are some people who really, really love it. We're kind of predisposed to endowment because we believe in long-term relationships both with individuals and with the organizations that they want to support. But there are some folks who feel like there is always need out there. And I want, when I die, I want that money to go to work right then and there. And they give it to them lump sum. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, we're just more than anything else exposing you to a different way potentially of, of staying connected with the organizations and supporting them the way you would want. So hopefully that helps. And very simply, the benefits are pretty straightforward. They are simple agreements. There's not a lot of legalese in them, you know, whether it's us or Communities Foundation in Texas or anybody else. It's shirt sleeve English. And, and the, the, most of the documents that we see in terms of donor advised funds, they're three pages. So you know, you're not wading through 40 pages of legalese. They're very flexible. As long as you're alive, pretty much you can make changes. Let's say you wanted to change you know, your charitable beneficiaries or the proportions that you were giving to your charitable beneficiaries. That's pretty easy to do you know, while you're alive. Um, it, it makes it so that what most people do is, okay, it used to be that people in their wills, if they had charitable beneficiaries, they would laundry list them in their will. And if they wanted to change that, they had to go back to their lawyer, and no offense, by the way, um, <laughs> but, uh, they would, they would have to go back to their lawyer and either revise their will or get a codicil to the will. And, and it takes a little bit of time and money and a lot of people put that stuff off simply because it does require both of those things. For us, changing an exhibit page in a fund agreement that says where, where those, uh, those gifts are directed, it's changing a page we initial it, we append it to the fund agreement, we move on. So it's a very, very flexible and efficient way of, uh, of, of dealing with that. And again, it helps you retain control in terms of ultimately where you want that money to go. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Okay, let's give some real life examples. And we've got two, two ladies to talk about. And um, this one is Rita Smith, uh, an alum of Ursuline Academy where I went and maybe some other people in this room went. Um, but she was, you know, during her lifetime, she was giving to her church, she was giving to civic organizations and causes, and, and she wanted to keep, keep giving uh, later. So, uh, but during her lifetime, she established a, a donor-advised fund, which we've talked about, and, um, and then five years later, she passed and made an additional gift to that fund of $1.2 million. Fast forward today, 13 years later, that fund has grown 
to $1.1 million. And so now every year she's giving away to the different organizations that she had listed in her fund with us. And you know it's our job to make sure those organizations um, get those funds every year. So, so that's put on us. Then another, another lady, Louise Buer, fifth generation Swiss immigrant, graduated a long time ago from Ursula in 1935. She, she was a parishioner at St. Bernard's and she had you know, been a faithful volunteer and parishioner forever. And she you know, looked around and didn't have as many family members to leave things to and wanted to name different organizations. And so her, she established a trust with us. She had some appreciated stock and some property and decided that would be a good asset to put into a fund. And it was one of those split interest gifts that Michael was talking about. So during her lifetime, we were paying her money. So from 1992 to 2000, so within eight years, she, was getting, uh, she got $360,000 from us as a proceeds from this trust. So that was pretty good for her, but then it's also pretty good for us because that, that asset increased in value and um, established an endowment, and today it is worth $11.6 million, which is huge. And she has been giving out money. You know, we go to these grant ceremonies twice a year, and we hear, okay, from the Louis, Louise Bureau Fund, you know, X amount of dollars is going to help the elderly or is going to help scholarships. And so her name is mentioned at least twice a year in public when we're giving these um, grants out to, to charity. So it's really great just to see how her gift and her name has, has lived on all this time. Yeah, and something that's, that's really interesting is she picked them. Okay, she picked the organizations and the causes that she wanted to support. It's not, you know, she gave it to the Catholic Foundation and we're the ones, you know, who are making that call. So she was actually involved in, in picking them. And it's really interesting because both Rita Smith and Louise Buer, I was over at Ursuline earlier today, that they're having a big alumni celebration over there. And Rita's picture, she was class of 34, and Louise was class of 35, and their pictures are basically side by side. And it's, it's just really sweet. And, uh, and Ursuline remembers both of them year after year after year, and they're connected with Ursuline forever. You know, which is really wonderful for them, for their families, and also for Ursuline. But, okay, and the numbers that you saw here, okay, no warranty expressed or implied. Okay, <laughs> she, she happened to hit, you know, an excellent time. You know, she was there for the, the dot-com rise. And, uh, and it's just kind of the magic of having a fund at a community foundation for a long period of time. This is 32 years later now, okay? It's kind of hard to believe, but it is 32 years later. But it's something where the anticipation is that gifts from funds like this will be even more impactful over the years than they are on the date that they are established. So that's one of the things that you, you see year after year. As a matter of fact, Albert Einstein many, many moons ago said the greatest force in the universe, the greatest force in the universe is compound interest. <laughs> so there is some magic absolutely to, uh, to compound interest in a fund. So and hopefully that's something we're able to help folks with. So a question that we get quite often is, okay, well, I'm generously minded, how much should we give? And it's a trick question. You know, but really what our job is at the Catholic Foundation is to give people ideas in terms of you know, what other folks experience has been and what they did, and then people pick for themselves. Yeah, that, that looks good, but I really want to do this. Or it's a specific dollar amount, you know, what have you. So everybody has a different idea of what is right for them and their family. But the things that we hear the most often are 10%, okay? And everybody, so Baptists are born with this, you know, Catholics come to it later in life, but everybody's heard of the biblical tithe, right? 10%. So it's, it's something where 10% from your gross estate, that resonates with a certain group of folks. So, and you remember we were talking about that $5,000 before for St. Joseph's, right? So, you know, some people are looking at, at, okay, they give to all these different things, but what they wanna do is they wanna focus on the core. If they're gonna have an endowment, they wanna focus on 
the, you know, this reduced number of charities and they want their giving to be impactful. Well, how much do you need in order to have an endowment that, that does that? Well, let's use our $5,000 example, okay? So $5,000, it's just, it's just a, a numeric trick. So multiply that by 20, okay? What's, what's 5,000 times 20? We got any math magicians here? It's $100,000, right. Um, okay, $100,000 is what you would need to kick out at 5%, $5,000 year after year after year, okay? That's the magic of an endowment. So if you took whatever number you have in mind in terms of supporting St. Joseph's, you know, maybe the Bishop's annual appeal, maybe you went to Ursuline, right? Um, so American Red Cross, it doesn't all have to be Catholic, just as long as it's not in, ca in conflict with Catholic teaching. So, but the thing is, is that get that number in your mind, multiply it by 20, and you know the size approximately of an endowment that you would have to have in order to feed that. So, so for math-minded people, that's a great example. Something that's a little bit more practical, and Anna alluded to it a little bit earlier, is a lot of folks, you know, because you're leaving, you would leave charity the same assets that you're leaving your kids. Okay, in a lot of ways, if you have these, these charities that are very important to you, you're actually treating them like your kids. Okay, because they're sharing the same assets. So something that resonates with a lot of people is the idea of treating charity as another child. If you have four children and you were going to divide your estate 25% each, because we're all very fair-minded, right? So we want to treat our kids the same. Um, well, instead of dividing it four ways and having them get 25%, think about you know, dividing it five ways. And okay, each of your four kids gets 20% and then there's a share to charity. That's the one that really seems to resonate with a lot of people. But again, you're gonna decide if you're charitably minded, what's right for you and how it works for your estate. Does that make sense? Great. Okay, so you know we're just about at the end and we're gonna take questions for a couple minutes, but let's talk about, okay, you know, I understand you know, we're ready to go. So what are the steps that you take in order to help fulfill your charitable intents. Well, first of all, pray about it. It's something where, um, you know, what is right for you will come to you in prayer. Um, and it's something that we encourage folks to do. Um, take a look at what you have been given to steward over the course of your life, the gifts that you've been given by God. And then from there, plan how you're going to distribute all of God's gifts. You know, if you're, are, are you going to include charity? You don't have to but you can, and how are your kids going to remember you as well? One last thing that I wanna tell you before we leave this is in terms of inheritance for your kids, there are a couple of things. Number one is less and less we're seeing people who give their entire estates to their kids. Well, why is that? And you know, we've all seen examples of how money uh, can ruin kids. You know, too much money can, can be trouble for, for kids. Warren Buffett had a philosophy that, that was really pretty neat. Uh, and his thought was, I want to leave my kids enough that they can do anything, but not so much that they can do nothing. Okay, his idea of something, by the way, and my idea of something are two entirely different things. However, but it's a pretty good philosophy to have in mind. The last thing I want to leave you with is, and and... My father, who passed away two years ago, and he's a matter of fact, he's in the Columbarium out here. He won't mind if I tell you this. Um, he only took my advice one time in my life. One time. And it's, it's like, you know, I, he was, we were talking about his estate, and he asked me for some advice. And it's like I had to hold the phone out. It's like, come on, this isn't my dad, I know. <laughs> but, but what was the advice? Um, my advice to him was the best thing that he could do for his kids was to write each of them a letter, okay? Not the same letter copied six times, <laughs> right? An individual letter to each of the kids telling that individual child what they meant to my father's life, okay? Sign it and put them away in a safety deposit box, okay? And then, as opposed to the number of zeros on the end of a check, let that be how your kids remember you. 
don't reduce it to just money. You know, make sure your kids know, no matter if you leave them a letter or not, or you know, if you just go and hug them this afternoon, make sure they know that you love them, okay? And with that, we'll entertain any questions that you might have. Yes, ma'am. How do we get paid? How does the Catholic Foundation get paid? Uh, you know, essentially, you know, for example, for donor advised funds, uh, you know, the base type of fund we have, the biggest percentage, uh, uh, you know, that we charge for a fund is 1% on an annual basis. And if you think about it, you know, a lot of times you hear a rule of thumb like um, a 10% expe expense ratio is really good for a charity. Well, if 99% of what you are putting into the fund goes to cause goes to support the causes that are important to you, we feel like that's pretty economical. But the Catholic Foundation, our, ba our base fee is 1%, but once you get over $2 million in terms of a fund, it goes down to 80 basis points, eight tenths of a percent on an annual basis, and then over 3 million, it goes down even further. So, so and, and also some people do, it's not required, but some people do give us charitable gifts. So, so uh, you know, we've been, uh, we've been blessed by a lot of our friends. So, turnover, you all, um, and then what do you invest in? Do you want to take that? So, uh, the question was, um, do we invest your funds, I believe is the question. So, so, so there's actually, when we're talking about donor advised funds, there's two types of funds. I have a fund that is non-market participating. That, that means that if I put... $10,000 into the fund, it's always going to stay $10,000, and there's no charge to me on that $10,000. There's another type of fund that is a, a market participating, which means it will be in the market, will be invested, and that's the one that will charge you 1%. But if the market goes up, great, your $10,000 goes up. The market goes down, your fund goes down. Does that help answer your question? So, and, and we have five different portfolios that we utilize. This is a little bit more than you wanted to know, but just know that we're a very conservative org organization by nature anyway. The first rule is don't lose the money, okay? And the second rule is don't lose the money. <laughs> so it's something where we're never gonna be the highest of the high flyers, but we're also never gonna be the lowest of the low in terms of investment returns, um, you know, but, you know, and we can talk more about that uh, later. You all have said a couple times, I want to make sure everybody understands. When you take money out of your IRA, you have to pay tax like it's income. Sure. Whatever you take out of your IRA after you're 70 and a half, you have to, that's income, and you have to pay income tax. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you have your broker or your financial person send a check directly to the charity, like I have them send a check to St. Joseph every month and I'm one to sharing our joy every month. I don't have to pay tax on that because I never got it in my hands. Right. And that has saved us paying income tax several years now. So right. I think everybody needs to realize that that's So worse. it's, you know, from a technical, that's a great, great point and very, very helpful. From a technical standpoint, that's called a qualified charitable distribution. Okay. How many people have heard of a qualified charitable distribution? That is awesome. And so basically the rules, you know, just high level is, okay, you make a qualified di charitable distribution to charity. It counts against your RMD. It does not count as income, which is really good, but you don't get a tax deduction for it. So, you know, they're not going to give you, the IRS is not going to give you a tax deduction for something that doesn't count as income. So usually it's a pretty balanced transaction. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Okay, good question. The question is, what's the limit on a qualified charitable distribution? It was $100,000, but last year they indexed it for inflation. This year it's $105,000. Is that annual? Or that is annual. So, you know, and, and there are things that you can do with an IRA now to, to get a charitable gift annuity, probably beyond, you know, uh, the, the scope of what we want to talk about today. But, you know, there are some options for you.